Long story short, this is my grave. The Owl House is a story that begins with death. Luz Noceda's journey of self-discovery and her quest to be understood stems from the things she shared with her father, their similarities and closeness, and is empowered by the love he left behind in the form of the Azura books. The world she travels to and becomes embroiled in saving is literally built on the bones of King's father, and Emperor Bellos's hatred is predicated by his inability to process the loss of the brother he murdered. Death and grief are what many people have described as a core theme of this story. And while I believe this is true, the other side of grief, recovery and healing from grief, should not get lost in that statement. Death and the grief that comes from it can transform the life of a person experiencing it down to the last cell. It changes how you interact with your routines, your hobbies, your relationships, even yourself. It leaves permanent marks. The person that emerges from a grief situation is not the same person who experienced it in real time. Death transforms. And this goes well beyond an emotional theme that forms the spine upon which the nerves of this story leap off of. The visual motifs are not subtle either. We have bones all over the place, detached body parts, and the blood of the Titan is the foundational element that forms the substance of magic in this world. It's really intense, it's fun, it's gross, and sometimes it's brutally violent. Witches even have an organ attached to their heart that enables them to practice many forms of magic. But of all the characters in this story, the one that ends up performing the most extreme version of narrative and literal blood magic that I've ever seen in a kid's show is the person who can't normally cast at all, Hunter. Hunter embodies the motif of death as transformation in a way that allows him to transcend the story of grief he was made for in the text, but also in the meta narrative. Today, I'm going to talk about why his death here is so powerful, but also necessary for that theme to carry. We're gonna talk about that possession scene, but first, we need to face the inevitable, death itself. The twin motifs of sacrifice and death are older than writing. Sacrifice has sacred connotations and refers to the act of offering a greater power something precious. Following from that, it means the destruction or surrender of one valued thing for the sake of another. I want you to hold on to that idea of preciousness. Preciousness, value, richness, these are all descriptors that give a death offered up in sacrifice weight and context. And this motif, death as sacrifice, is extremely prevalent in human narratives the world over. The key word here is is the execution of the death motif. The highest forms of sacrifice in history and fiction are often measured in blood, as blood is sustaining and limited. That has an inherent value in the arithmetic of a dramatic story. But when it comes to the kinds of sacrificial deaths that transform a character, the question is why is this life so precious and dear? Not just to them or their friends, but to us, the audience. Their journey, what they have worked hard to obtain, and what they desire is bound up in this shed blood. From Odin sacrificing himself on the branches of the world tree for the secrets of Arcana to the modern forms of the hero's journey, literal and metaphorical death is part of the formula that creates a hero. It represents through some kind of cataclysmic event that the hero has come back changed, but returned with knowledge or wisdom or resolve to share with and or save the community. They have faced their fears and sacrificed everything at a critical moment, only to gain something else in the end. In order to obtain victory, a hero usually has to let go of everything they wanted First. This death is usually symbolic, especially in animation. The best use of a symbolic death gives us the benefit of a hero giving everything up in a sacrificial moment, the tension of the audience genuinely waiting with bated breath to see if they're actually dead while performing narrative work, opening the door to the victory the hero was striving for, even though they may have come out of it forever changed. This is often shown through things like permanent marks, the loss of a limb, hair or eye color changes, scars. Right, let's do this. Out of all the Grimwalkers, you look the most like him. Hunter, from the moment we meet him, is a dead man walking. He is the latest in a grotesquely long line of dead men, or should I say boys, since based on how many skeletons and masks we've seen, it's impossible for all of them to actually have lived to natural maturity, who were created to wear the face of Caleb, the brother Bellos murdered himself. This just begins to put the grim in Grimwalker, as Philip's truly insane exercise in creating an endless parade of homunculi of Caleb shows us a up version of a toxic generational cycle of horror, horror and strife, strife, something that each Grimwalker born into it is unable to escape alive. The story of my brother left me for the boiling aisles and I will make him and 
all these witches pay. And every Grimwalker's death just propels Bellos' madness ever on, literally farming the experience of Kalos' betrayal by spilling his blood ad infinitum. These boys are disallowed any autonomy, bodily or otherwise. And if that wasn't bad enough, Hunter has a sigil, which in hindsight tells us he was already marked for the slaughter. This kid is thrice doomed at the starting line. Our proper introduction to him is Luce saving his life from an assassin who absolutely would have succeeded if not for our hero's intervention. And finally, Flapjack adopts him. Now, why is that significant? Well, cardinals are best known for their symbolism in terms of representing romantic love and loyalty. However, what made me lose my sh upon seeing the little guy for the first time was the fact that the cardinal's other meaning is that they represent the whispers of your beloved dead or ancestors and offer courage and guidance. Hunter's very body is the result of the murder of a brother, the slaughter of a gentle, intelligent creature, the harvesting of a sleeping animal, an artifact so precious that one might very well have to kill in order to obtain it, and the profanation of the ritual to make a palisman. Even the way he's trained to bow is morbid. Unlike Lilith, for example, Hunter has been trained to fully expose the back of his neck, which unlike a bow of respect or genuflection is the gesture made by a vassal who has made a fatal mistake presenting for execution or to highlight their master's mercy when they don't chop off their head. His name is less of a name and more like a factory tag. Even without Dana's confirmation, we know it's a sick play on the phrase witch hunter, reinforcing the lack of real personhood to his abuser as well as a reminder of his purpose to that abuser, to help him kill witches. And if Lilith and Kikimura don't know his name, it's safe to assume no one else does either, and this is validated in later episodes when people are either calling him the Golden Guard or coming up with dumb epithets like Darius's shockingly inappropriate little prince. It further reveals that he has really no human connection to anyone except Belos, and that's a fiction. He's also asked to inhabit the role of the faceless Golden Guard so completely that no one in the castle seems to know him beyond it, and his main priorities within that role seem to have a lot less to do with the administration of the Emperor's Coven and more about acting as an extension of Belos's will. He is fully enmeshed in Belos, and at this point, if you were to ask him, it would be really hard for Hunter to know where Belos ended and where he began. Even the magic that Hunter uses while under Belos's influence is bloody and gross, not dead flesh being contorted into various shapes and uses. AO3 user Princess of Denial pointed something out to me that I think really drives this point home. Hunter gleefully unaware and using the kind of magic that's probably responsible for his own creation and the fact that Belos's magic is so organic and bodily could suggest that he considers Grimwalker's tools exactly like these sabers and other items conjured up with this kind of magic. If a literal tool is made out of flesh, then why would someone made out of flesh be different from a tool in Belos's eyes? Both Belos's magic and Grimwalker's are stuck between being alive and dead. In many ways, the person that is Hunter is almost as much of a ghost as Caleb is. The only thing he really has is a semi-private rebellion with respect to an interest in wild magic and an unarticulated dream of freedom. In a way, he's what we might say, narratively speaking, barely alive. Until he has a life-changing adventure with Luce the Human. Hunting Palisman was the proper establishment of Hunter's character, and frankly, I think it's probably one of the best character revealed episodes of anything ever. The first thing they do, though, is establish that blood tie he has with Bellos. And while it's not the one he thinks it is, it's still a blood tie, and we'll get to why this is important later. They pull him out of the bulk of his armor and show us his face in the manifestations of his rebellion. He establishes a truce with Luce and is amusingly shown to be utterly unable to hang on to any lasting ire after that, instead letting her connect with him through a mutual interest in wild magic. She's treating him as a peer. This is something he has never experienced, something he's never known. He's never been known. And it's in this offhand moment that he ends up revealing the murmured wish of his heart, freedom, that inspires Flapjack to choose him. Like we touched on earlier, the name Hunter has been a secret leash between Hunter and Bellos, and when presented with the crossroads of fulfilling a mission in conflict with Hunter's gentleness and empathy, he gives Luce his name in a desperate, very transgressive attempt to be known before launching into a full-blown self-sabotage of his own mission and damn the consequences. He wards off Kikimura and makes a point to protect Luce during this scuffle, and most importantly, lets her fly away. He has a staff now. 
and the opening of the episode tells us he can zap huge distances. He could have caught her, and the choice to let her go here was incredibly deliberate. It is important to note that at the end of Hunting Palisman, Hunter still, on the face of it, is motivated by his loyalty to his uncle. He's chained to him through blood, and that supposed familial connection. But there's also the implication that as far as Hunter knows, his life is forfeit without Bellos, worthless without the Emperor's context justifying it. It's how he survives. He has no life right now outside the Emperor. But through Flapjack's adoption, a window, or portal, if you will, has opened for him, even if the blood tied to Bellos and his fictional story is still strangling him. So for Hunter to live, to really live, he needs community. Friendship, if you will. I will journey back to Eclipse Lake. Eclipse Lake, as an episode, manages to be one of the most amusing and also depressing episodes in the whole show. As Tumblr user LollyT once articulated, if you look at it from Flapjack's perspective, it's hilarious because it's the adventure of this inexhaustibly patient bird desperately trying to get his witch, who hasn't yet accepted that he is, in fact, Flapjack's witch, to make friends, trying to help him through the door and onto the threshold of people who can actually help him. However, we're not here for the funny, and we need to talk a lot more about blood and magic and boy howdy does Eclipse Lake open strong by reinforcing the blood tie between Bellos and Hunter by pretty much telling the audience flat out that Hunter is a clone. But the most iconic scene of Eclipse Lake is undoubtedly this. Long story short, this is my grave. Want me to make you one too? This is really bumming me out. That's just life, Rat. Everyone has a use, and if you don't, Bye bye Now, before I get into how important the scene is with respect to death and Hunter's arc, the fact that Zeno Robinson gleefully shared that this was in Hunter's audition sides, and as far as I can tell, basically unchanged in terms of the actual dialogue, implies that this was a really, really important moment for the story from the very beginning, especially because the broad strokes of a character as typically presented in an audition represent what they're like overall, and we never see anything quite this unhinged from Hunter ever again. And it's on a rewatch of this scene about a hundred times over for a totally different analysis that something clicked into place to me for why. This scene is explicit foreshadowing and a direct parallel to Hunter's possession and death in Gravesfield. This scene takes place in a body of water, dry or not, with a central struggle over Titan's blood, where the emotional hinge is a second where Hunter, however briefly and symbolically, accepts death. The key thing here is that at this moment, Hunter feels like he has nothing to live for if he can't fulfill Bellus' expectations. Let's put this in perspective for a moment. The Emperor's Coven is a cult. It's built around the person of Bellos himself, the true speaker for the Titan, and his product is a salvation only achievable through his idea of righteousness. The main tool he uses is fear of punishment, but also exile. The way that cults enforce this kind of control is isolation and kneecapping a victim's ability to make outside connections. Even if Hunter doesn't think Bellos will kill him directly for his failure here, disfellowship from a cult situation, especially for a powerless witch, with no friends is basically the same thing. Tumblr user Polyhexian summarizes this situation very well. Entering the Emperor's Coven literally means abandoning your friends and family and home, wearing a mask, and no longer even using a fucking name 90% of the time. You become a faceless part of a mob, all meant to think and behave identically in service to a greater master. Hunter has been pulled into the deepest levels of all of them, and the threat of disfellowship is the worst to him. He has been intentionally encouraged to be a smug little douchebag because it makes people hate him. It keeps him isolated. It means no one is going going to help him and he knows it. Even if he ever reaches a point where he wants help, he can't have it. He knows that if he ever tried to leave, there would be no one who would take him. He can't escape. The Boiling Isles fears or resents him. Everyone else in his inner circle despises him on a personal level. And the cherry on top of all of this, with the reveal that he's a clone, the repeated allusions to his replaceability and audience hindsight, we know full well that the thing he is changing Chasing is a complete and utter fiction. No matter what Hunter does, no matter how perfectly compliant or useful he could ever hope to be, the proof of that is stamped on his wrist. In this moment, he is ready to die nothing for nothing, and such a death is tragic and empty. It's through a moment of offered friendship, something outside the life he currently has, facilitated by Flapjack, 
that he gets back up. And even though Eclipse Lake doesn't go the way that Flapjack probably hoped, Hunter does have a real friend now. There is a true, powerful connection between him and his palisman, and it was very earned. Hunter isn't someone who goes down easy, and boy, in the context of the kind of abuse heaped upon him, the kind of bravery to make that connection is remarkable. He experiences suicidal ideation at a critically important moment of hopeless terror, but it's really important to stress here that Hunter is someone who wants and yearns desperately and really doesn't want to die, even when he doesn't have anything to live for but the fantasy of his uncle's approval. He spends most of this narrative scared out of his mind of failure, disapproval, and rejection, and yes, dying. He is someone who for the first part of this story is barely alive, just surviving. The wish for freedom and autonomy that brought him Flapjack was an articulation of his desire to live. And now, for the first time, he has something to lose besides his life. Remember what I said earlier about sacrifice? I'll be home soon, Flapjack. Stay safe. I love you. Over and out. I touched on bravery a little bit earlier, but I want to go into more detail for this section. Bravery is a trait that can be attributed to a lot of heroic characters just by the nature of a hero's position in a story. Bravery is acting despite being afraid. It might seem a little strange at first to describe a character who spends most of his time on screen cowering, flinching, and reacting as brave, but that's just it. He's consistently able to act no matter how terrified he is, especially in defense of other people. Bravery is a word that often goes hand in hand with the idea of of sacrifice. But I really want to stress that the reason bravery is associated with sacrifice is less because it's inherently noble to sacrifice and more because sacrifice means braving the experience of loss. Hold on to this thought as we proceed. After Eclipse Lake and forming a true connection with Flapjack, Hunter starts building what's called emotional equity. Tumblr user Imperfection You Will Find, a certified therapist, describes emotional equity as positively investing in relationships, as if depositing money into an emotional bank account and keeping that account balanced by building up qualities such as trust, openness, and tenderness. He's able to make and keep friends, which are what enable him to survive Bellis's first direct attempt on his life in Hollow Mind, and it gives him the courage to reach out and eventually join the Hex Squad against him. But even at the end of King's Tide, he's not quite free yet. Bellos still commands enough control over Hunter through that blood-soaked bond of abuse lies and manipulation that re-inspires Hunter's learned terror of the man. He is able to summon up an incredible amount of courage to do this, though. I only wanted to help you. You're... you're lying! He's not in a place where he can fully assert himself and sever those binding threads. Hunter's barely sure who Hunter is right now, especially given that he's still reeling from the whole you're a clone of a dead man who helped Bellos. But Hunter does know this. He cares about these people, and he will defend them even with everything he has. At this point, that includes standing his ground and holding Bellos' gaze. Anyone with an experience of abuse or who knows somebody who has experienced abuse can testify to how difficult even holding holding that gaze was. Familial toxic abuse cycles are exacerbated by proximity. This is especially bad when the abuse in question tips over to the enmeshment we were talking about earlier, wherein the abuser is unable to see the victim as anything other than a hollow extension of themselves. An enmeshed victim doesn't act like themselves when under the abuser's influence. Once again, Tumblr user Imperfection You Will Find has a much more detailed breakdown on this specific aspect, which I will link in the description. But the bottom line for us today is this. Hunt Hunter, a cult survivor and abuse victim, can't begin to figure out who he is and what his life is about without some distance, time, and space to develop secure attachments. So even though we see Bellis go splat here and watch Hunter symbolically cross a threshold towards recovery, we the audience know that Hunter still has a way to go here towards figuring out who he is and obtaining real freedom. So remember back at Eclipse Lake when Hunter is symbolically ready to die and has nothing but emptiness to survive for? Thanks to them fills that life up real quick. Everything's okay. Bellas is gone. Let's recap a bit. From a narrative perspective, Hunter needs time and distance to build up that sense of personal identity in order to transcend the narrative of a victimized puppet into a person with real, full autonomy over his life and future. In a story steeped in the theme of control, the context of the familial cycle of abuse between Bellos and Hunter means that when it comes to choosing a battleground for this pivotal, climactic conversation, there is really only one stage that can do justice to a war of autonomy and bloodline baggage, the body itself. 
The Owl House isn't particularly subtle about this theme either. Almost all the kids struggle for their autonomy over the course of the story, and express their growth and rejection of external control by making changes to their outward appearance. Things like clothes and especially hair are used to mark major shifts in a character's arc. Hunter, on the other hand, has spent the entire show changing into clothes that fit whatever his Bellows framed mission happens to be. And honestly, given how much of a freak Bellows is and how obsessed he is with the look of the Grimwalkers, I bet you anything that Hunter was not allowed to chop off that silly hair noodle because it was so heavily reminiscent of Caleb. After he leaves the Emperor's Coven, he's shown wearing a jumble of lost and found rags and later a completely nondescript bland outfit that alternately reflects confusion, desperation, and a total blank state. So now, in the Noceda household, for the the first time, Hunter has the security to start building that emotional equity we discussed earlier, secure attachments, and a sense of who exactly this Hunter kid is. He has a chance to put distance between himself and Caleb's ghost, changing his hair, dressing himself for the first time, accumulating patches and ideas about the things he's excited to identify himself with. It's childlike, it's heartwarming, and a little heartbreaking because of that tender sincerity. So who exactly is Hunter? Well, he's an empathetic and gentle boy who is nervous about a lot of things. He likes his hair short. He has a big, fat, embarrassing crush on a girl he worships. He loves to talk. He can't roll his R's. He's bisexual, likes pizza, is an aspiring weeb, a Star Trek nerd. He loves to craft artworks with his hands to express his creative passions and loves his friends. His friends mean the world to him. In a subtle shift, he even gains an association with wolves. Like, <laughs> this is played for laughs. Of course, the creative nerd boy loves wolves, but there's also a really potent symbol here because unlike a much more classically masculine association with wolves that leaves heavily into boring sh like the hunger or an over the top sexuality or that lone wolf nonsense, the point of it here is to emphasize a few things about Hunter and his recovery and frankly, the reclamation of a very cruel name. Wolves are pack animals living in connected family groups. They are also the quintessential animal of the untamed wild. Wildness. Wolves are said to be untamable. They have wild magic, if you will. They could even be said to embody it. The father wolf also is a masculine archetype that has a protective warrior, but also gentle quality that I think definitely merits a mention, especially in contrast to the very ugly masculine arrogance represented by the likes of Bellus the genocidal conqueror and hater of wild things, who chooses to represent himself with the imagery of a deer and caged birds. Unfortunately for Hunter though, the brief reprieve ends when Bellos comes back to finish the job he started way back in Hollow Mind, and the question of Hunter and Hunted is back up in the air. I don't care what you want. Goodbye. Evelyn. So here we are, back at a dark blue lake, fighting over a reliquary of Titan's blood. Once again, the noose tightens around Hunter's throat. But now, as Bellos has taken violent possession of his body through his blood itself, making that metaphorical control and external enmeshment fully literal. Using that bloodline story, Bellos is once again trying to bind Hunter to the narrative of Caleb's death. But frankly, the bastard's main interest is in hurting Luce. Hunter, as ever and always, is just a body to him and an extension of his own will. But this time, the water has risen. The gravestones are everywhere in a way that remind me a lot of the mass grave in the Titan's skull, all being presided over by the outstretched wings of the bird in the cage. This is a dark fucking scene. The first thing Bellos does here is go, oh, this won't do and savagely asserts himself by undoing the outward signs of Hunter's character development. He removes as much of Hunter's cosplay, the clothes Hunter made with his own hands, as he can, forces his hair to grow out again, shaping him into Caleb's image once more, deforms his skull by growing horns, rots his bones, and puppets his voice into an approximation of Bellos's own to taunt Luce. You're not even trying right now. What? Afraid you'll hurt him. This is especially ugly because that mocking tone confirms what we already suspect, given what we've seen happen to Bellos's other victims. He's killing his nephew even as he's using his voice to utter those words. Later, he uses Hunter's own right hand to slay Flapjack, and in a jaw-droppingly cruel twist that actually made me flinch from my screen, he tries to make Hunter eat his own palisman's essence. Flapjack, Hunter's first true friend, and 
and the one who opened the door to love. This is the moment that inspires such rebellion from Hunter that he's able to fight back. Hunter loves his friends. He will defend them with everything he has. Before, that meant protection against Belos. And now, well, as far as Hunter sees it, he has one option left. So now we get this, and I want you guys to listen to the way this is worded. You know what I'd like, Bellos? I'd like to leave the Emperor's Coven and never step foot in that throne room again. I'd like to study wild magic and learn how to carve palismen. I'd like to attend Hexside as a regular student and play fire derby with my friends. But most of all, I'd like to make sure you never hurt anyone again! Even watching this for the first time, I was astonished and a little confused at the word choice here. They picked the words I'd like instead of I want. Now in a basic creative writing class, most teachers would correct I'd like to the stronger, more active I want. But this is a team full of incredibly skilled writers. So the choice here is clearly deliberate. I want refers to something desired in the now and in the future. It is active. I would like is a polite request at best. And in this context, it is an angry, grieving resignation. Hunter, the Grimwalker made of a murdered man's bones, animate of Caleb's silent ghost. Hunter, who gained a life and filled it with love and friends and dreams and burning desires and creativity from a narrative perspective is now capable of a sacrifice that can affect a transformation and a return. He has so much now that will grieve him to lose, and he grieves. Each line here is a direct reference to a transforming part of him, the explicit verbal acknowledgement of his abuse by Bellos, a desire to study wild magic and representing his bond with Flapjack, a cry for normalcy and friendship, but his desire to protect the people he loves supersedes all of these other ones. He will do anything to prevent Bellos from hurting them anymore. And this this sacrifice has incredible weight because of everything it took to earn it. So he throws the titan's blood in the water and dives in. This pond, rather than Eclipse Lake, is his grave. I know there's some ambiguity here as to whether or not Hunter actually dies in this scene. And sure, art is interpretive, but based on that speech, his intentions are pretty dang clear. And you cannot convince me that a kid with this much military training doesn't know how to swim. Trial by water, at the time Philip and Caleb were doing their witch hunting, was a common prescription for witches. If you float, you're a witch. If you sink, you're innocent, but at least you get to heaven. Sucks to be you. So Hunter, clone of the witch hunter Caleb Wittabane and his fully enmeshed brother Philip, experience an ironic execution as witches, completing Bellos's version of how this story should go. I do have a bit of a conspiracy theory here that there may have been a cut shot or two that showed Hunter swallowing water or otherwise preventing Bellos from swimming back up because he sinks like a stone. I strongly suspect the censors were shown an even more more intense version of what we got and screamed, you can't show a child drowning himself. Either way, I don't think Bellos would have left Hunter's body unless he was positive that he finished the job. He's already failed to kill this boy twice. So Bellos fucks off back to the demon realm to complete his revenge and Hunter dies in Willow's arms. From a narrative perspective and true to the motifs of blood and magic in this story, Hunter has performed a blood sacrifice, relinquishing everything he wanted to beat Bellos's story. That he failed to take Bellows down is inconsequential. What he did do is by dying, he has transcended the narrative of the thrice doomed Grimwalker of Caleb Wittabane. He is free of that chain of blood now. And Flapjack, Hunter's first true friend, the whispers of his beloved dead and guiding spirit, the one who opened the door in Hunter's heart to let love and found family in, is able to give the life that Hunter built up for himself back. Flapjack like Hunter, was always a dead bird hopping. He was always going to have to leave in order for Hunter to grow in stature as a character, like Nanny McPhee, but a hell of a lot more tragic. But what this means is that when Hunter opens his eyes, even though he's been changed and scarred by his incredible grief and loss, we see that Flapjack hasn't left him, and Hunter still has a future to look forward to. There's death, grief, and the promise of recovery in those eyes. This is really bumming me out. 
So that was a lot. And it does take a lot to surprise or disturb me in terms of cartoons. I've been around and know what's up and possession scenes are nothing new. If anything, I find that they're a bit overused these days and sometimes lack a dramatic punch because a lot of these possession scenes are in the form of a remote and distant villain taking control over a main character in order to raise the stakes and pit the character's powers against their friends. It's a means to an end for this villain and doesn't usually have a personal aspect attached. However, this possession sequence is so different from all of those that we just showed as examples and so shockingly violent that even in the middle of watching it, I didn't make the comparison until I saw a few takes out there that complained that this scene was gratuitous. I want to talk about that word for a second. Gratuitous means uncalled for, lacking a good reason and otherwise unwarranted. I strongly disagree with this assertion. Hunter's story has so far been that of a dead boy, a cult survivor chained to an abusive family member's toxic inability to let go and an inability to assume responsibility for his own monstrous actions. This abuse has left Hunter with physical and mental scars and the show makes a point to realistically depict symptoms of CPTSD like panic attacks, habitual flinching, and proof that he's been trained to take a punitive beating from anyone. This story tips on the fulcrum of defining who he is and separating himself from that toxic bloodline story or succumbing to it. And his villain, who has spent the narrative seeing Hunter as nothing more than an extension of his own will, really only has one tool left to try to take back control in this relationship by the time thanks to them rolls around. It's not the possession part that people find so disturbing. It's the fact that this is a horrifyingly realistic, if fantastical expression of how this sort of severe physical and emotional violation plays out. It's about taking back power. It's cruel. It is extremely violent and it's very personal and intimate. And like the other aspects of grief in this story, Luce's realistic processing of how she grieves for her father, Ida's grief over her life, her resolutions with the Owl Beast, it would honestly do this story a disservice if they didn't take Hunter's story to the categorically appropriate place for him to overcome. He's passed through the gates of the worst thing that could possibly happen to him. He has experienced a metaphorical and literal death in that he has died to Bellos's narrative, but he had to gain his own life, his own self, sacrifice it freely, and return through the portal created by Flapjack's love. It's only once he comes out on the other side of that door that he's able to sever that last lingering tie of fear of Bellos. All lingering control is gone now. In For the Future, we now see that he can even help others from their physical and mental prisons. Hunter's blood sacrifice, his death, and love enabled his resurrection and transformation. Love transformed him. Flapjack left him his eyes and his wings. And Hunter, the boy who wished for freedom, can never ever be truly bound by anyone or anything ever again. And isn't that a beautiful story? I came to the Owl House fandom late in the game. I rediscovered it after asking myself why the heck I wasn't watching the gorgeously animated show about queer disabled witches processing grief and overthrowing a Puritan dictator on the bones of a decaying titan. And despite the heights of intensity that such a premise promised, I was truly not prepared for how profoundly this story was going to affect me. I binged the entire thing in two days and caught up with the show about 36 hours after Thanks to Them aired. And after sitting on my carpet for about two hours in stunned silence, it was only then that I took to the internet in search of community and someone to talk to because holy moly, there's just so much to discuss. But if a year ago, you told me that of all the characters in this wild cast that I'd end up obsessed with, it was gonna be a white boy named Hunter, I probably would have laughed. This video airs a day or so before the finale of The Owl House, and never before has a show astounded me to this degree, and I'm not sure I'll be ready, but death is transformation. One ending is the beginning of something else, however sadder and wiser we come out. It can leave marks. Grief can change every cell of a person, from the heart to big ol' scars. As we live, we go through metaphorical deaths all the time, some much bigger than others. No one is the same person they were 
five years ago. Death and resurrection in fiction are incredibly important ways for us to experience these things, to gain compassion for our inner child, to see our traumas from angles that allow us to look at ourselves and by extension everyone else with the same compassion and hope that we would extend to a favored fictional character. Dark as hell? Oh yeah. This world is full of Phillips, but it's also filled with the light of understanding, friendships and forgiveness, opportunities to let go of self-judgment and grow into our own. People who will help us look inwards and examples of the worst hands life can deal you and not only the acceptance of them, but powerfully making holistic peace with them. Hunter's story is a very powerful expression of triumph over toxic family cycles and a desperate fight for autonomy. Dana Terrace choosing such a grim story, that of a cult survivor fleeing abuse, discovering found family outside of a bloodline curse, and dying not for but to the story written out for him was an incredibly bold and personal move because of how dark and painful that story can look. They pulled very few punches. And yet, Hunter's story is among the most inspiring in the Owl House for that. A truly boggling number of audience members strongly identified with what he goes through, and I can't say I'm not one of them. After experiencing his story, I was able to take a hard look at how grief and all of my little deaths affected my life, but it also allowed me to have a lot more compassion and empathy for both myself and others. I was able to extend it to him after all, and that is one of the great powers of representative fiction. The Owl House is a story that is saturated with the theme of death and motifs like blood and bone. The writing team had the courage to deliberately sketch out a fantastical but deeply grounded narrative of what it takes to transform out of the grip of an abuser's control, with an incredible amount of nuance and sensitivity. It's all the more welcome in that the message is delivered so well to such a broad audience. And by using the theme of death, it offers a demystification of the horror associated with that kind of cataclysmic change and offers a future beyond the cathartic experience. Death is an inciting incident, not just an end. Grief is a process supported by love. And resurrection, that's the transformation. And I'm really grateful that this story and this crew had the courage to tell it. Because always, on the other side of death, there is a door that leads to the future. Thank you all so much for watching. Please let us know what you think in the comments. What did you all think of Hunter's arc and the handling of the theme of death? If you liked this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll all see you in the next one. And oh my gosh, I hope you all enjoy the Owl House finale. Whee!